Today, I would like to talk about three things, which I will introduce. Lots of uh, things and material that I will talk about is on my uh, GitHub IO page. And I hope you can have a look if you're interested too. So the, th the three topics that I hope to talk about in the remaining half an hour is that I think it's a good idea to have an introduction to my university, my laboratory, and just we talked a little bit, a couple of minutes ago that we will also organize DAFX 23. Hope to see most of you, some of you here. And we know that we should get the visa process or any kind of travel arrangements as soon as possible. And then the second topic that I would like to talk is the state of AI in audio. So I'm not going to talk too much on the foundation models there yet, but rather I will um, try to answer a call by Scott Howley, which I was planning to do uh, in the ASA meeting, uh, directly expanding his call a bit. So today I will return to that a bit and try to understand where are we in, in AI. And then the last part will be on conclusions and future work. And hopefully by that time, it would make sense. Why are we trying to aim to bridge AI in multiverses with differentiable models and MLOps, machine learning operations. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is my university, Aalborg University. We are located in Denmark and we have three campuses. Our mothership, the headquarters are in Northern Denmark. And if I can find my way about the university, uh, we will have we have approximately 20,000 students in different stages and a crew of about 5,000 uh, people. Is that right? I, that's what I remember, but we can double check it. And the university gets lots of uh, praises about their about our practical approach, a problem-based approach. And uh, we are a very young university established in 1970s. And we try to get uh, as much as specialized students to sound and music computing as we can. And uh, the links, everything are embedded in the presentation. I can share it as well if you like to visit the links later on. Uh, in this university, we have several different campuses and one of them is located in Copenhagen. So I think I'll be able to find some of them somewhere here, the different campuses. Okay, well, there's somewhere here, but in Copenhagen, we're located in an ex Nokia research center and we inherited several audio labs and equipment. And the next, uh, Think that I'm going to talk about multisensory experience lab is located in one of these ex Nokia facilities. We have a small anechoic chamber and a 64 channel wave field synthesis and lots of lots of uh, input devices and audio devices, tactile devices. And we're primarily working with virtual and augmented reality. This is our bread and butter that uh, I cannot for some reason embed multi-sensory experience lab in the PowerPoint presentation, but few words about the laboratory as well. We try to make basic research and applied research. In the basic research, we're interested in fundamental questions about multi-sensory technology and users, perception, cognition, effect included. In applied research, we try to solve industrial problems and uh, also focus on specific user groups. And the people of the laboratory are, uh, the laboratory has been funded by Stefania Serafin and Rolf Nordahl. They're co-directing uh, the laboratory. I work as an associate professor on sonic and embodied interaction. We have another associate professor doing hearing research 
And then another associate professor looking at the um, multisensory interaction in virtual realities, especially walking. We have several PhDs. Actually, we have one more PhD from here just started. So eight in total at the moment. And we have uh, visiting researchers from Stanford and Milan. And uh, student helpers are a fundamental part of our profile because they're getting used to practical applications of virtual reality and audio multi-channel sound uh, right into the laboratory facilities. I'd like to go back to the presentation and this is our fundamental setup on dealing with multisensory experience with strong emphasis on sound. So I will mute the video and show you several things we do in the multisensory experience lab. One of them is building virtual reality musical instruments. I cut the sound deliberately. So the idea is to be able to construct and play musical instruments in real time and possibly with haptic devices or um, other musical interfaces. So for that, we have a code base that whatever we want to deploy to virtual reality, uh, we can easily combine these models and uh, play them. And also we can implement some digital effects processors again in virtual reality. It's our mainstream research. And I would like to also play again without sound, another approach for movement-based interactions in the virtual reality. That is from a workshop in 2019 that we invited uh, creative coders and virtual reality institutions and also AI researchers to uh, capture uh, motion capture devices. We're working also with motion capture suites with uh, 19 sensors and six degrees of freedom. And right here I stop because uh, the idea is to get the motion capture in real time and make generative choreographies, generative artificial motion capture scripted by a particular uh, choreography or way and then also use the wave field synthesis, possibly go into the latent space of the models and make a generative one person experience in virtual reality. And here, I think since you are in a doctoral school, then you would look at the no code machine learning platforms based on one of our collaborators models that we can get large amount of throughput data in a no coding environment and we can run machine learning almost in real time. <coughs> so what is not shown here are several NAS devices and network protocols to make everything as fast as possible. And with that, we made a piece and made a documentary about how the piece works. And that was 2019 and it is basically the start of my talk. Because around that time also in Denmark, there was a big initiative to change the nature of AI in the country and also in Nordic states. So as a time, as a time encore, I think end of 2020, a report came called the Nordic state of AI. And in that report, it was very clear that Denmark was investing quite a lot in AI and much higher than other Nordic states, but the return of investment was not very, very high. For example, here's a comparison between organizations mentioned in AI, different Nordic countries. And in Denmark, that was not widespread as other countries. So that, therefore Denmark started to invest a lot of money to educate people in AI and also find different use cases. Uh, the situation is significantly better in 2022, but lots of problems are not solved. And the main difficulties on working with AI is by far the lack of talent, lack of educated people, and then uh, data, and then the investment infrastructure. 
So that was one leg that we thought it could be a good idea to extend the day operations of multisensory experience lab and look at, at AI. Another, another interesting moment was that the sound industry is always uh, big in Denmark. So that is the third biggest industry and there are 52,000 people working in the industry. There is a huge demand on the educated people in all aspects of sound and music. But uh, uh, despite of this dem demand, the a again, the AI-based companies are not too common and they're not returning too much investment yet. So in that level, uh, we started to look also to the some obstacles, and one of them was the model deployment time. That it is, we're investing and in researching AI-based tools in every, every field, but they're not easily coming to the production. And the typical time is uh, about a month, if we're lucky, but there's also a large number of models which never see the production. With that start, when we were thinking about, okay, what can we do, the, the DSP came. And there was a turning part in our, in our activities to understand, to look at the interesting frameworks that we can do all these operations, real-time processing, also in the extended realities, and hopefully real-time with particular models that we really like because they depend on our DSP knowledge. So that I think lots of people are working on the DSP and uh, it is a very structured model based on neural vocoders. And that was an interesting point that we said, okay, now I think it is time, we, th we thought it was time to look at the AI-based learning with the specific uh, idea of deploying these models as soon as possible. Right now, I don't want to go back too much in time, but um, before my PhD, back in 97, I published my first shallow model on, on uh, parameter estimation for physical models using machine learning. And it went into the production in two years. In 99, we were seeing a real-time system doing machine learning inference in real time and uh, providing high quality audio. And then in 2012, we looked at another model and deployed it to MASP MSP in six months. And interestingly, we could run the code after decades very easily because the first one was working in MATLAB, the second was on MaxMSP, the libraries were very clear. After we started to look at the DSP, we were fascinated how clear the model data and the code were. And uh, we thought it was a very, very nice start. And immediately tr tried to make some things using the DSP framework and extending towards whatever is coming. And, there are a lot of things coming all the time, extending the frameworks, enabling real-time operation, which is great news for our field. I think 2020 to 21, we looked at several things. Maybe I can show in the model better. So as you probably are familiar with, DDSP uses MFCCs for latent variables, but it's not visible from the outside that much. So we thought about, is there anything we can do with the with that latent variables? Another problem was that everything in the DSP is frame-based. So we're working with um, non-recursive operations. Is there any way to change that with the recursive filters and implement most common algorithms within the framework, not only depending on the finite impulse response filters. And uh, based on that, we started to make experiments, which by now, there are much better uh, formulations on them. But the good thing for us was they were working almost in real time. So we could make simplified real-time algorithms very, very easily. 
one of them probably uh, some of you came from Izmir and there's even continuing research on making, um, for example, FM synthesis using differentiable uh, DSP and other algorithms. So we try to, to expose this latent space for operations using uh, several operators, extending the formulation with some envelope generators and naturally FM synthesizers. And we could generate quite a lot of uh, very interesting sounds, albeit not very systematically. So then the next year we continued as well and more and more models are coming. But my point of exposing all of them is to say that it's getting harder and harder to backtrace these algorithms because of the dependencies and it's getting harder and harder to backtrace the data. So we could run several algorithms we made 20 years ago easily, but not the ones that we were making one or two years ago. And we started to think that's a, that's a problem. And uh, how can we solve this problem? And the solution was to extend and look at the machine learning life cycle a bit as it happens with lots of different fields. So besides the code and model and data, we started to understand that there's a lot of versioning, automation and other uh, tasks are necessary. And while when we started at looking for that, then our way of thinking about the real-time models started to change a bit. At one place, there was Scott's call about building more and more deployable machine learning platform. And in the, at the other direction, there is an increasing music AI ecosystem uh, that we can use and embed in our work structure. These are great news, but at the same time, other communities like the machine learning operations are looking at the uh, machine learning lifecycle from a much comprehensive, much more comprehensive way, looking at real-time machine learning and looking at the data drifts, data version control. And, and also, even if we would look at the deployment, we know that our way of deploying is making real-time uh, models, plugins, but there are much more opportunities coming every day. And, this means also lots of dependencies, lots of platforms to look. Therefore, combining all this and looking at other communities' practice, we started to go deeper and deeper into machine learning operations. May I ask in that moment is if ever anybody is familiar with this maybe overused figure, you can raise hands or say, grab the microphone. And if you saw it, this is from uh, Scully uh, from Google, looking at their practices of machine learning systems and understanding that the machine learning, the models and the code is a very small fraction if you look at the whole life cycle management. Uh, we, in a recent machine learning operation schools, we were uh, PhD school, we were counting the instances that we see this slide and almost every presentation showed that slide, which is very influential and in looking at the whole machine learning from a different point of view. But we also know that this is good for Google, but we're not Google, we, we are a university. And although we want to reach the industrial type of deployment, we are having much more modest resources and, and workforce. Therefore, we started to customize this idea of life cycle for our specific demands. The first figure uh, on the left-hand side that I show is taken from uh, Josh and Andrew uh, McPherson's book about summarizing a general structure of a plugin. This is our bread and butter. So we would like to keep on working with the real-time plugins since they want have to be real time inferring the models, they have to be small in size, small in operation, 
Then we really like the idea of combining that with the graphical user interface and editable models. Then uh, we have a lot of opportunities using Juice and other platforms to deploy them also for the Unity or even Unreal platforms as plugins. And finally, deploy them in the virtual reality, not only for inference, but even for model building in the real time. So that was our predict um, desired workflow. And we try to understand and customize this protocol about how to realize them. Three important concepts was the software 2.0 platform that the code needs to be developed slightly differently for, for uh, maintainable machine learning. The second was the importance of human computer interaction and making for making musical instruments. And that vision come from Jaron Lanier. And he was thinking about uh, some platforms in virtual reality that you can construct and run at the same time without distinguishing between the author and editing mode. And the Carpeti is uh, ex-Tesla's director, uh, also taught a lot of machine learning and doing it so at the moment as well. And maybe the third aspect, which we needed to use and don't see too much in the contemporary machine learning audio is uh, streams, real-time data, making, making training models with lossy data and also real-time data, which we produce in multi-sensory experience lab in uh, almost terabytes uh, daily. So for us, a bottleneck is how to store the data, how to tag, how to convert them to the machine learning. And we're realizing more and more that we can use some tools from the machine learning operations to address this problem. Based on all of that, I will show a bit to what we're doing now and where we're going with. But for us, the most important thing is nowadays we are looking at the model development. There are very nice models coming every day. The data is being standardized and the code, we all use PyTorch, TensorFlow, in some cases, JAX, some frameworks that are really, really polished for our operations. And it can be made also uh, run real time. But in the future, we have to look at data pipelines, model preparation environments, and deployment specifically to DevOps practices, catalogs, and also governance for enhancing the life cycles of these models. Therefore, we chose as our targets, the deployment and reproducibility as the first schemes and started to engage in communities, both machine learning operations, but also uh, a lot of hackathons, Discord channels that also your school organized. And then there's other IRCAM organized very nice uh, ways of looking at the real-time neural audio models. And there's Neutron, we try to engage with all these communities and try to learn about how they're doing. So in the discussion, I really would like to talk to you more about what you're thinking and how you're addressing these problems as well. Uh, but before finishing, few few things. Here is the extension to the multi-sensory experience lab. I took the photograph over the weekend. And right now, I am sure that you're familiar with some of the devices here, but at the moment we have a new space to extend the multi-sensory experience lab operations and integrate more and more with machine learning. We have an NSYNT, we have a, uh, also the Sansel Morph that it's becoming our everyday interaction with real-time audio models, modular synthesis that we can get the real-time audio. Here is NVIDIA Jetson and here is NVIDIA uh, Orin and depth cameras and configurable mixers. And here's a 3D short drop projector as well that we try to 
integrate everything into our workflow. And this is our current direction, future direction that we want to make projects and attract more funding on that. We're also talk, learn, uh, working a lot with the machine learning operation tools that will look at the solution in iterative stages and look at mod modeling from a different point of view. And uh, these are our current operations. Time will tell if they make a difference, if they shorten deployment times, if they help us with not having bad code and making value all the time with, uh, with the models that we're producing. But at the moment, I will have one more thing to show later after this slide. But I would like to conclude that I try to make an introduction to Oberg University problem-based learning, then going to the multi-sensory experience lab, my lab, that we primarily work with virtual and extended realities and multi-sensory experiences from the human computer interaction point of view. Then I look at the state of AI with a particular lens. We're very happy with all the developments and we try to catch up as much as we can. We're fascinated about the new ideas about the models and the availability of databases. We also would like to use everything also in the extended realities in real time in a maintainable fashion. And for us, the current and future work will really try to deploy everything into the multiverses. If you look at the relationship between the extended realities, metaverses, or any kind of names that people give, they're coming to blockchain and reinforcement learning. And for us, there is much more value, much more real-time operations that we can do. And we're excited to look at the differentiable models because they are for us almost the foundational models for real-time audio. I think uh, we didn't get too much mileage when we looked at open AI jukebox type of big, big models. For us, the real value is the differentiable models with a small footprint, but it can run in real time. And one more thing will come just now, but before that, I really wish, would like to thank Josh, Alvaro, Stefania for suggesting, uh, Scott for giving the idea of more production in audio, Jesse for the DDSP framework, IRCAM ACIDS team, Antoine, Philip, and also uh, everyone at your center, because we're also trying to look with our students to several hackathons and events and all your publications, uh, wonderful demonstrations to add a value for uh, real-time operations in our field. And the one more thing is, I didn't say too much about the foundational models yet, but if we carefully look at what is bringing the transform transformers relation is that is probably uh, to look at the very fundamentals of how we're training the models. For us, that is going back to the essentials and understanding how the attention works. And for us, probably that is the direction of the real differentiable neural audio computing, combining the hardware software operations and we have a huge, huge expectations about the real-time GPU operations to come. Okay, so this is what I plan to, to show, to provide in a framework. I'm aware that I didn't talk about the particulars of models, neither data, but for us, this is the leading direction that how we want to approach the field and develop. Since you're a very productive community with lots of new ideas about the models, I would really like to see here how you relate to that operations, how you relate to some data management, how many of you are using data version control, streaming model learning. And I would like to, of of course, learn more about if you have some pointers, particular ways of doing. So from here, I hope to engage in a 
in a conversation for learning and uh, sharing experiences. So I stopped to share the screen, but I can return if anybody has a particular common question about the slides. 